Hello, this is Dr. Justin Marquis for another Education Unbound chat on OnlineUniversities.com. Today's guest is Sharon Bowler, the founder and president of Bottom Line Performance, a company that develops game-based learning solutions for business, government, and nonprofits. While it seems that a majority of Bottom Line's work is for the corporate world, I think Sharon's background coming from a graduate program housed in education and working with adult learners using games presents a unique perspective on how education and learning translate beyond the classroom and could provide some guidance for the future of learning in all contexts. That said, welcome Sharon, fellow Indiana IST alumnus. Thank you very much and probably fellow sad person at the loss uh, in the tournament last week for IU in basketball. Unfortunate, yeah. <laughs> it was unfortunate, but I'm still uh, Still a fan. Still yeah, a fan. They'll, they'll be good next year and the year after. So we've got a coach now and hopefully no more violations. There you go. There you go. So for starters, can you tell me and the audience a little bit more about what your company does and how you came to start it? I, I can. Um, you did a very nice, succinct 30 second elevator speech. We are a learning design company. We're based in Indianapolis, although we serve clients uh, not only in the Indy area but on a global basis. We focus primarily on the corporate sector. We do some work in the government sector, but not a whole lot. And our focus tends to be on those things that are more technical or sales or process oriented things. Um, our sweet spot, as I like to call it, is more of the complex, robust curriculum design stuff. And we produce learning solutions um, in e-learning, games, still the old classroom based stuff video, etc. So our focus is less on having a hammer um, so we can only hit nails but on trying to really understand what's going on and where a learning solution might be appropriate and where it would not be appropriate at all. Um, how I got into this is honestly I am pretty passionate about learning myself. I love to learn. I believe in lifelong learning and it engages me and I like to inspire other people to learn. So. I started the company in 1995, um, kind of as a result, my undergrad is actually radio and TV, and I thought I was going to be doing documentaries or uh, producing that kind of thing. I landed in a training spot inside a government agency and found out that I really, really liked helping people learn, and so I shifted focus, started the IST program at IU, and kind of discovered my path. That's wonderful. So yeah, the uh, the whole corporate training world is a huge open open ended um, avenue, and a lot of that having having been a retail sales manager for many years while in grad school and <laughs> doing part time grad school, uh, I know that a lot of that training can be extremely tedious and boring. The CD ROM training. So how do you add value to to that sort of experience for your learners that that they don't normally have? You know, I, I want to tell you, we fight an uphill battle. Sometimes I feel like Sisyphus, pushing the ball uphill and never quite making it to the top before it rolls down. Because a lot of times clients will come to us and they will say, we need a one-hour training on X. And it can be the hardest thing in the world to try and reorient them and ask questions such as, so tell me what problem you're having. Tell me what kind of business results you're trying to get versus what you have now. Tell me what you need people to be doing on the job. Um, often what you need people to be doing on the job is not what they intended to put into the training program. People, clients are often very content focused. We try to shift that and make them performance focused mm -hmm. and then design the solution to resolve the performance issue, um, not to deliver a bunch of content. And that kind of segues into why I like games. Mm -hmm. Because games tend to be more of a immersion experience, if you will, or a way to get people actually doing the performance that you need them to be doing with mm -hmm. feedback coming at them continually based on how well or how poorly they're doing. And I think it's just a good match. Um, so that's kind of how we try to orient it. I don't want to be producing click next to continue stuff. That's great. So my advisor at Indiana, my dissertation advisor, is Tom Brush, and I don't know if you've had a chance to meet Tom. He's in your area. Um, but we have a lot of ongoing debates about the value of games in education. Ah. And um, one thing you said is that your company and you like to develop 
uh, unique solutions for each problem. So instead of having a solution and then applying it arbitrarily to every problem you get, you find the specific problem and you develop a solution specifically for that problem. Is that, that fair? That's fair, or at least a unique approach that kind of considers mm -hmm. that it's not about when you work with a subject matter expert, they tend to bring you a big pile of source content and, and say, here's everything I want to tell this target group about X. Um, and we try to approach it, but what do they need to be doing on the job and how do we have to resolve that? So there's a uniqueness in that fashion. That's not to say that we have no solutions that look similar. Because right. if you're teaching salespeople, you may apply a certain model to helping them learn how to sell. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is definitely contextualized for their situation and their needs. So do you see games as offering you the flexibility to customize for any kind of audience for any group? Is that one of the reasons you, you like games so much? The reason I like games so much is because I think they work where a lot of other things don't. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's almost fascinating to me to watch the total change in demeanor and behavior in people when you place a game in front of them. Mm -hmm. So you can watch them kind of sitting back, distracted, etc., from what they're doing. Maybe they're on their Blackberry, maybe they're doing something shifted away. And suddenly when you're playing a game, their attention becomes very, very focused. It matters to them. They're, they're participating in it. They're, they're a part of their own learning as opposed to that college model where you go sit in a classroom and someone lectures at you and tells you what you need to know. Mm -hmm. That's why I like games is because games can inspire people to want to learn it. And I think motivation is everything in learning. It's the number one factor that will dictate whether you learn or not is how motivated you are to do it. And games can be very helpful in sparking motivation. That's great. Um, and I absolutely agree with you. <laughs> So I, I write and focus a lot on education, education policy, and I know that's not your area. You're more corporate. However, you do have strong opinions about the place of games in education, and you recently responded to a, a an article by Ruth Clark entitled Why Games Don't Teach. And if I could, I'll just read a brief quote from your response to that and then ask you to, uh, to talk about that a little bit. Okay. Here, here's your, your quote. I'm all in favor of ongoing research by those who can devote their time and attention to this research and share it out with those of us who are practitioners. However, I won't disregard the plethora of research that I believe already exists to show games work and to show that people require engagement and motivation to learn, something games can provide. I think a thoughtful instructional game designer can do reasonable audience analysis and formulate an action plan as to the best type of game for the target audience. We do this all the time at BLP and we've had great and measurable success using games across age, across age groups. So you clearly are passionate about games and education, and Clark's article, I believe, was focused on education, not corporate training, more than anything. Well, I felt like she was trying to cross all genres, and I know she got hammered after she published it, and I think her intent really was to be deliberately provocative. Uh -huh. um, she, If you read the article that she wrote, once she gets into it, She's really trying to say that games may not be better than other solutions for teaching. Sure. And I think that that may be fair, but I think they're an awfully good alternative to a lot of lecture-based approaches that we see, and I know you probably see it too, used over and over and over again. Right. Um, her argument was more about there's a lot of ways you can create an interactive experience. It doesn't have to just be games. She did also go on to... to to try to argue that she didn't feel like there was sufficient research related to game-based learning, and I definitely disagreed with that, as did some other pretty well-known names in the industry. Um, I know Carl Kopp wrote a pretty compelling rebuttal to her, as did uh, Clark Quinn. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's been a lot of head-to-head -head studies to show that games can work better than non-game methodology. And I think we have, you know, some really well-known um, folks in the field, James G. or Guy, um, mm -hmm. Jane McGonigal. Um, mm -hmm. Her TED Talk is fantastic, and her book, yes. Reality is Broken, paints a compelling picture of how games reach us where other mechanisms don't. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I was a little frustrated with with Dr. Clark's article because I thought it was um, misleading. Great, uh, and and I can absolutely see and agree with that statement. So, can you share a little bit of? your experiences, how, how you've seen, I know you talked about people's posture and attitude changing. Are there any other things you, you notice or have, uh, have recorded from game-based learning that, that contradicts her statement? It matters more to people. So um, we created a game called Formulation Type Matters for an uh, ag company. And we did the usability testing on the sales reps who were the target, and I described the posture. You know, so you would see them leaning into the game, you would see them being intent. But but what was in that game, the game goal was to hit a certain sales target. They had to hit at least $700,000 in the sales territory to win the game. And everything they did in the game either contributed to or detracted from their sales. So, and they were also monitoring customer satisfaction and customer complaints as they go through the game. Mm -hmm. I watch those guys take copious notes on the side because one of the things they could do was ask the customer questions. And if they asked good questions, they gained potential sales. If they asked bad questions, they lost sales. And if they asked an irrelevant question, nothing happened. They didn't gain or lose. So they're making careful notes on what the customer is telling them. Um, they're paying close attention and they're being told that there are certain resources that they can use to go find information. They're taking notes as they review the resource. And when we did the first usability test, we had designed the game to, to constantly reward. So they, just by asking questions, they always got money. Mm -hmm. And once they figured out that asking any question got them money, they quit asking questions. When I changed the game scoring so that bad questions cost them money, the posture changed and you could see them being very vested in hitting that goal and getting very frustrated if they didn't hit the goal. That, that doesn't happen in a traditional, um, let me just explain all the things you need to know about formulations type course. Sure. We did, um, I did a simulation I designed several years ago for a pharma company and it was really to help people understand um, the mismatch often between the leadership behaviors they believe they exhibit and the leadership behaviors they will exhibit when put under pressure. Mm -hmm. And so we have everybody start out, it's very benign, and they rate their, their perceived beliefs about how they behave. And then we put them into the simulation that's a timed simulation where they have to work in virtual product teams creating and getting this product to market and the a regulatory agency is going to be reviewing and QAing their product at the end of the launch period. We throw some curveballs in the middle of their development process and we change requirements on them. They're supposed to test before they go to the regulatory body and a lot of them ran out of time and so they didn't test. What happens then is when the regulatory body appears in this game, half of them lied. <laughs> Oh, that they had done the testing, the pressure to perform and succeed. It was such a rich experience to do it that way. I do not believe we would have gotten there mm -hmm. if I'd have used or not gotten there as well if I had designed it a different way or designed it as just maybe a discussion-based lecture where people could talk about how they thought they would do. Sure. It was the experience of playing the game that brought that to light for them. So this is a dumb, dumb question given what you've just said, but part of the pushback I hear about games is that they can't, they don't, they can't or don't accurately simulate real world situations, real world conditions. So the learning that happens in the game doesn't transfer to the real world. Can you address that pushback? Gosh, I think that runs counter to what a lot of the data would tell you. Um, and I'm, I'm blanking out on the study, but it was done for the Department of Defense. They actually put heart monitors and pulse monitors on to kind of show um, how people's demeanor and behavior, their their respiration, their pulse, their physiology, yeah, physiology, all changes as their emotion changes in the game, and mm -hmm. they they do simulate it. 
um, the, the simulation that they go go into is so realistic that it causes that same visceral reaction that you would have if you were really in the situation itself. And I think what games do really well is they do it in a safe way. So I can make mistakes, I can um, see the consequences of those mistakes, and I can go back and retry, which in real life a lot of times you cannot do. Sure. You fail and you're done. Yeah. Yes. You're fired or whatever. Or somebody got hurt or mm -hmm. um, you got hurt. Sure, particularly in industry, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's and um, for me, this this is uh, easily applicable to education at at lower levels than at corporate training level. Um, do you see any any ways in which you know these things wouldn't match up with with what the goals of education are? I think it's yeah. I got your questions in advance and I sat and reflected on this. I think one of the differences in education often than in corporate training is that education sometimes is about content. Mm -hmm. It's about, I'm going to tell you what you need to know on subject X, whether that's history or science, etc. Whereas in corporate training we do hopefully try to focus more on here's what I need you to do. Process, sure. Process, yes. And um, or being able to apply principles to something and use those principles to guide you in how you behave or in decisions that you make. So sometimes I think um, if your focus is really on content, mm -hmm. games might not work as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced of that and I'm not sure that we want to turn everything into a game because I know that education is not designed to be entirely um, entertaining and that's not what I mean by a game. <laughs> But I also know that people learn better by experiencing things than they do by reading about things or listening to someone describe things. If I think about how we all learn to drive, we don't do it by reading the driver's manual. We do it by getting in the car and driving. And scaring our moms. Yes. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, math often doesn't make sense for us or mean much to us until the first time we have to go make change or figure out how to pay for something or budget something and games do a great job of creating simulations that allow people to do that. At the lower levels when kids are learning math facts and spelling and phonics mm -hmm. I think that games can be a way more engaging way to do something than simple rote tasks. I worked as a tutor in a homeless shelter um, for a year and I used games as an incentive for those kids and I thought it was kind of sad because I was trying to incent them to get through the worksheets mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that they had as their homework and then we could play games and I had my iPad and I loaded it up with all sorts of math games and reading games etc and those kids would far prefer to, to do that where they're kind of getting feedback and getting to make mistakes and to self correct and kind of be immersed in it then they got out of doing worksheets. Worksheets were something that you force people through. They're painful. They're painful. <laughs> so yeah, and I guess that's one of the questions you, you kind of glazed over this. Why, why do we have this expectation that education and learning can't be fun? You know, is that that I seems like a fairly new, you know, innovation? I guess you would call it. <laughs> I, I, I don't know because I, I mean I think back to my own formal education and the things that engaged me were always those things that were either self-directed like I, I was the kid who really loved doing the science fair projects when I got to go off on my own and create it and I also liked doing a lot of group projects where you could sit and work it out together with your peers. Um, I found it extremely painful. I was a hyperactive kid and I hated sitting and just listening to the teacher. Mm -hmm. Now, conversely, now I can enjoy being part of a MOOC. Um, I did the MOOC that um, University of Pennsylvania did on gamification mm -hmm. because I was highly motivated. I wanted to know more. I was sitting through the little video lectures without a problem. I was doing the assignments without a problem. But the key, regardless of format, is just how motivated you are as a learner. And I think that the game can be a motivating factor for a lot of people.
Well, I didn't know you had taken a MOOC, and I write negatively about them quite often. So yeah. I'm wondering, um, your experience, I know you were motivated for this one. Uh -huh. how, how do you view that medium for instructional delivery? As a seasoned instructional designer, where do you see that fitting into the hierarchy of effectiveness for designing and delivering instruction? I, oh, well, I think it's got a very specific niche. I don't think it's going to work for most people. We have several people now because uh, I took that MOOC last year and it came around. They're offering it again and I encourage several more people to take it. So we have probably eight people here now who are taking this gamification class, um, getting up to speed on it. And I've heard feedback from a couple of them that they find it painful. Mm -hmm. um, it's he, one person comment. He goes, "Well, it's just really no different than si sitting in a university classroom, except I'm watching a video of a professor talking instead of physically being there with the professor talking." Mm -hmm. But what I liked about it was the way it was organized into what I would call learning snacks. You mm -hmm. could watch a video that was seven to ten minutes long and then be done if you wanted to. I would often bring it up on my iPhone and put my headphones in and while I walked my dog I would listen to two or three of the lectures. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought it was very useful for me as I was getting highly specific pieces of information that I wanted. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think most people would sit through that format. I know that there were 80,000 people in that class when it started and they had less than 8,000 that actually finished it and got a certificate. 10%. Wow. Yeah, the ten percent. So the dropout rate's pretty high, but did I need to complete it to get what I needed out of it? No, I did not. Um, I was kind of cherry picking some of his lectures and picking mm -hmm. what I wanted to do. One of the things that I did like and find value out is I went ahead and I did one of the early exercises or homework projects where I had to write a pitch for a game strategy, a gamification strategy. And when I submitted it, I had to then review, I had to commit to reviewing this work of five other people. Mm -hmm. Three or five, I don't remember which. Um, that motivated me to put some time because I knew I was going to be reviewed. I put some time into the review I gave to others. I didn't know who these people were going to be, so I wasn't motivated to give them a good review so they would give me a good review. Mm -hmm. I just gave them an honest review of their work. And I felt like what I got back was an honest peer review of my work. But that was pretty effective. Mm -hmm. Would that have worked well for other learners? Not so sure. Yeah, um, for, for somebody like you who has a dozen years of experience or more doing this, the feedback you can give is far different than the feedback of somebody who's just interested in the idea and hops in for the first time to learn about it. Yes, I mean, I was I was definitely at an advantage in doing the assignment over. But then I think that that's what peer learning is partially about: is the opportunity for others to learn from you and from you to learn from others. So I thought that piece was kind of intriguing. Um, I thought the discussion forums were a complete waste. Eighty thousand people in a discussion forum is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I just quit looking at them, quite honestly, because they. The flow is so fast and furious and disconnected that it was not very meaningful. It was meaningless, yeah. Yeah. I see that. So this uh, this MOOC experience and your work, which which I would characterize as informal education to a certain extent, it's not part of a university or or whatnot. It's it's done within a a specific setting, but it doesn't count. It's not giving somebody a degree or a certification. Does that make sense? It's not, but I will tell you. For instance, we. Um, we have a game engine, Knowledge Guru, mm -hmm. and we've created several games for customers off of that. Um, sometimes those games have a lot of meaning for people. We did one for Exact Target right before they launched a product, and that helped them, helped the people who took that game, played that game, be more successful in selling than they otherwise would have been. So it mattered to them. We're doing a game for Cisco right now that is part of their sales certification program. So in that instance, those folks are definitely playing the game as one means of helping them prepare for their certification process. So you kind of anticipated where I was going to take that question, and that is what is the actual value in the corporate world to the training that you give? And then do you see, uh, going back to the MOOC, do you see the potential for things like MOOCs or other informal learning that you could do online or a job experience or you know one that's commonly thrown out there is military experience. Do you see value 
from those experiences in the corporate world? And then do you see something like badges being a way of actually measuring that and being incorporated into the hiring process in corporate America? No, I, I pray, I pray, pray, pray that we do not go to awarding badges to people. And um, people get bored with badges really fast. Yeah. Um, if you think of Facebook experiences like Foursquare is one that comes to mind because you could be mayor of a place and you could earn all these badges for visiting. That's intriguing and fun for about two weeks and then you get bored with it and you're done. Um, the power of badges to keep people incented over the long term I don't think is very good. I think it can be a very interesting and good short term incentive if you're doing something that's um, just a real short five-day kinds of experience. Maybe you can badge people throughout it, and they can be tracking each other's badges, and it might incent them. But I don't think it's a good means. It's kind of like the clout scores, if you're familiar with clout. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of people trying to say that they're going to use those to assess whether they want to make a hire. Mm -hmm. It's such an artificial measure of someone's skill sure. um, that I don't think it's, it's very good. But do I, back to the question of informal, I think companies need to get a lot savvier about the informal learning. Um, ASTD's State of the Industry Report, ASTD is the American Society for Training and Development, they do an industry report every year. And their report on the average amount of hours that a employee will spend in quote unquote formal training ranges from 31 to 39 hours a year which translates to 0.015% of their time spent in formal training. Well, we have a need to learn all the time. So the focus, if we spend all of our money and our time on 0.015%, what are we gaining? Sure. Um, at BLP, we have a, a goal of about 100 touches or opportunities for informal learning in the course of a year. So um, we do a, a social chat called Talk Tech. Mm -hmm. Every week we'll get three articles related to the learning industry, to tech learning technology. We'll post those on our blog, and then we'll have a chat about them. Our employees probably participate in one or two of those a month. You know, mm -hmm. There's always somebody participating. Each individual employee might get to do one or two of those a month. We have the brown bag lunches where people do things. We have the MOOCs going on where we tell people, go ahead and take what you want. We have skill builder projects where people get to define something that they want to learn more about or how to do, and they create their own. So that's how we build skill. I mean, can you imagine? We're a 20-person company. We are not going to have a lot of formal training where we're bringing in classes or creating classes. We want people to learn on their own, and we want them to know how to learn on their own. Mm -hmm. um, I think companies kind of shoot themselves in the foot when they set such high productivity goals that people don't have time to learn anything new. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're probably wasting a lot of their money and time when they put their focus on formal instruction. Are you familiar with Ebbinghaus's Forgetting Curve? No. Herman Ebbinghaus. Uh, 1885, 1895, I don't know when. He, he formulated a theory called the forgetting curve, and it, it turns out it's pretty applicable. Um, you go through and learn something once. Mm -hmm. Within about three days, you've forgotten 90% of it. Wow. It takes multiple repetitions. That's where the whole um, research base on spaced learning came from, that we tend to remember things for longer periods if we space learning and repetitions out over time. Sure. And I think that comes about best with informal, mm -hmm. supplementing the formal, because you're going to have the formal instructional experience once, you're going to leave that classroom or that online environment, how are you going to remember it? You're only going to remember it if you have an opportunity to retrieve it. That's great. So we have to create those opportunities for retrieval. Mm -hmm. So going back a little bit, um, do you find in your experience working with corporate America that people are coming out of our education system and they are not equipped to be lifelong learners, self-motivated learners, independent learners? Uh, do you see that as a problem? I think the, the people coming out now are more equipped by far 
than those of us who are the baby boomer generation. Mm -hmm. I think the baby boomer generation does expect to be more spoon fed than the younger generation. The younger generation is very savvy with social media tools, with Twitter, with Facebook. They're going with Google. <laughs> Those kids grew up Googling everything. Sure. They know how to go out and find and locate what they need. Um, I think that there's an opportunity here for companies to do a more thorough assessment about what people need to know cold mm -hmm. versus what they need to find and locate just at the point of when they need to use it. Mm -hmm. That's where mobile actually comes in. It's a great tool for the find and locate, let me find what I need just when I need it. Mm -hmm. I don't have to remember it forever because I can go back and find it the next time I need it. That's great. So you, you still see, despite the prevalence of mobile devices and mobile information accessibility, you still see a need for people to have a certain body of knowledge uh, in their brains that they can pull out when they need it. I do, and um, going back to the Knowledge Guru game engine, the whole reason we created it was because I got so frustrated with clients who would really want people to know information cold. You see this a lot on the sales side, when people have to acquire product knowledge to be able to effectively sell the product. They need to know features. They need to know benefits. They be able, need to be able to respond to common objections. They need to have sufficient background in the industry they were selling in to understand the customer's potential problems. Great. How do you learn that? You learn that by multiple repetitions and exposures. Experience. And yet what companies often do is they'll create a sheep dip experience where you're going to go in, you're going to go for product training, and you're done. <laughs> and then maybe that product wouldn't launch for six more months and by then you've forgotten everything. Yeah. So Knowledge Guru, I de we deliberately designed it so as you're playing through levels there's three paths that you have to deliver scrolls to this guru guy. Each path is an iteration of the same information so for any level of play you're being exposed to the information three times if you make mistakes, you get immediate feedback, so that's a potential fourth time. Mm -hmm. And then when you go back on the path, you get that same question or scenario again, so you get a fifth time. Mm -hmm. And then there's what we call a guru grab bag level right. that unlocks and you can push it out later, and it's a randomized database of all the content that you've had before, which mm -hmm. gives it to you a sixth time. And if you space that out right, you're helping people with the stuff they really do need to know cold. Mm -hmm. You're giving them a way to do that instead of just feeding it to them once. And it's a game. And it's a game. <laughs> or it's a gamified experience. I, I prefer to think of it as a gamified experience more than a bona fide game because it's not really a strategic game as are some other ones that we might design. Mm -hmm. That's great. And do you want to tell a little bit more about Knowledge Guru? I played, and I have a bone to pick with you about the basketball one. <laughs> you got to talk to I am a basketball player, and I did not do well on that. So you, yeah, you in, in particular, there was well. one about which player do you want to double team? <laughs> and your, your default answer was to double team the guy who scores 24 points a game. However, they also had a guy on the same team who averaged like seven assists a game. And if you can double team that person and take the ball out of their hands, I think that is a completely valid tactic in a, a real basketball game. <laughs> well, you know what? It probably is, and you should have tweeted back to the guru to let him know that you disagreed with the answer and seen what he might have done for you. Oh, I didn't know I could do that. Huh? Yeah, yeah, you could have argued. Um, <laughs> and actually, I think you still have time because we have that college hoops competition going on right now where someone wins the 1000 bucks uh, to give to charity if they hit the top of the leaderboard. So I would I would say it might be worth lobbying for you. <laughs> um, knowledge Guru was just again that response. I, I can't count the number of times we would have people for sales or process knowledge, both things. We need people to learn this. And they would want them to have a one shot course. A sheep dip as you call it, yes. I call it sheep dipping. Um, <laughs> And I was just like, this isn't going to work. They're going to forget it. That Ebbing House forgetting curve, they're going to forget it. What if we could design a game? And the other thing is, is sometimes it's just boring. I mean, it's just boring information that you have to learn. It's not highly engaging. It's not stuff that's riveting. Um, 
door hardware, for example, is just not exciting stuff. But people may really need to know what different kinds of door hardware. Yeah. So we tried to gamify that experience by creating the guru. I wanted to get repetition, and I wanted to space learning out, and I wanted to incorporate the just-in-time, right when you make a mistake feedback, so that when you're learning new information, it's more easily embedded the correct way. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of instructional design behind it, and I would say that the guru game is fun enough. It's, a, it's an example of something that if you're not really motivated to learn that information, you're going to think, well, this is just okay. Mm -hmm. But in environments where you have to learn it and the prior experience you've had learning it has been the sheep dip, click next to continue kind of experience, it's a pretty good experience. That's the feedback that we get. Um, mm -hmm. Casual players who will come in to do the demo games, well, this was okay. But when it's, I had to learn this, and this made it so much better for me to learn it. When it's in a real high-stakes context, yeah. Yeah, it's different. Huh, that's great. Well, I have definitely kept you too long, so just a, a final question, uh, and then I'm going to ask you for one thing. So where do you see education in 5, 10, 20 years? And I, whatever you want to talk about, you know, K-12, higher ed, in, or corporate training, where do you see those things going? Do you see an evolution? Do you see change? Or do you see status quo? I'm not going to speak for K-12, but I think there's going to be a major change in higher ed. Mm -hmm. I think higher ed has been getting away for a very long time with charging exorbitant rates for people to acquire an education, and now we have this big pool of kids who paid a lot of money and have a lot of loans and no, they job. Have back and no jobs. Yeah. I think we're going to start to see a swing back to people thinking more in terms of vocational education, mm -hmm. two-year degrees, more pragmatic degrees. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Code Academy. Yes, I do Code yeah. Academy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, something like that where people can learn programming mm -hmm. and then go and use that very pragmatic skill, I think there's going to be a rebound on that. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that I don't value the liberal arts education. We have a ton of liberal arts graduates who work here. Mm -hmm. Liberal arts degrees do a great job of helping people learn how to think critically and analyze, and those are important skills. But we can't be charging people forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars to get that education and then come out and make a salary of thirty-two thousand. Sure. There, there, so there's there's going to have to be a blend and a shift in, in the education model to make it more expensive. I, I've heard Bill Gates tout the ten thousand dollar model mm -hmm. and going all online and I I don't want to see it go all online because there's a there's a lot to be gained by being in the classroom and yeah. interacting with your peers but it's gonna have to change um, to be financially viable mm -hmm. I, I agree I think we are right at that tipping point to quote uh, Malcolm Gladwell so we are looking at a big change in the way education and, and learning I think will go and I think Mobile has something to do with it. Online has something to do with it. MOOCs may or may not have anything to do with it. We'll see. But um, yeah, we we definitely are changing what knowledge and learning are. So finally, I, I saw on your website that you have a Primer for Play webinar coming up. You want to give a little pitch about that? I will, and I'll give a bigger pitch for the Play to Learn workshop that we've got okay. coming up through ASTD um, at ASTD Ice. Primer on Play is just a 45-minute webinar where I kind of talk about why games, why games work. Mm -hmm. um, I link game elements to the elements required for learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, motivation, relevance, contextual practice, feedback. And then we do a demo of Knowledge Guru and kind of talk about games as a genre and do a case study of how one game we did in Knowledge Guru got specific results for one of our clients in terms of business results. So it's kind of a nice wrapper for people who are trying to get their heads around what is this thing with games and why do they work. Mm -hmm. um, in May, I'm going to be doing a one-day workshop with Carl Kopp called Play to Learn, and it's a learning game design workshop to help people learn how to design games. Oh, that's great. So I'm real excited about doing that. That's May 18th in Dallas. Um, you can sign up and just go to the pre-conference workshop if you want. You don't have to go to the whole ASTD conference, although that will be an awesome experience as well. 
That's great. Wonderful. Sharon, thank you so much for meeting with me and talking to me and touching base with a fellow IU alum was wonderful for me. Thank you so much, <laughs> Justin. It was a pleasure to talk to you. It was a pleasure. And we'll stay in touch, and I'll uh, shoot you out the link to this article once it's written. So it should be next week. Great. Thank you so much. Have a thank wonderful you, day. Sarah. You too. Take care.